Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. Welcome to the August 2018 Clutter Conversation webcast. I'm your moderator, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Our topic today is Leader of the Pack, the Clutter Fairy Guide to Packing. Gail will share a few thoughts on the subject, and then we'll have time for your questions. If you have a question before Gail has finished her presentation, feel free to share it in the chat, and I'll ask it at the appropriate time. Or you can use the raise hand feature or just send me a message through chat to let me know that you'd like to ask the question yourself. Then I'll turn on your uh, microphone or camera so that we can see or hear you. Um, okay, over to you, Gail. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. <laughs> Um, Ed said that I have a few comments about packing, but really I have a whole lot of comments about packing, so bear with me. I'm going to have to check my notes, and I'm going to have to be uh, referring to them throughout in order to give you all the details that I have. Um, back in May, we prepared a meetup where we were talking about preparing for a move or using move strategies to help you declutter the house, and um, the commentary from the Clutter Fairy diaspora was all about um, packing techniques as part of that conversation, and so we wanted to uh, cover some very specific packing techniques as a sort of a slice out of the how to get ready for a move pie to help people get ready to um, put their things together and hopefully get them to the other end without breaking. So uh, I'm, we're, we're gonna talk about those things and uh, hopefully at the end you'll be able to pack a box. <laughs> so the first thing I wanna say is that uh, I need to remind you that when you move, Everything, it hopefully, will get there at the other end, but generally, something is going to get broken. Whether you use professionals or whether you get your friends to come in exchange for pizza and beer, you are going to have people, uh, you're going to have things uh, being carried by who knows how much training. You don't know whether the professionals have a complete training or not. You, your friends certainly don't have move training. And so uh, it's likely that something is going to get broken. So you need to just sort of be prepared for that in advance. And the best thing you can do to protect yourself is pack the stuff well with enough cushioning, with good packing techniques so that if somebody drops a box, if somebody puts the box in upside down, if somebody puts boxes on top of a piece of furniture and it falls over in the truck, that most of the contents will survive and you'll be okay. So this is what we're aiming for today is uh, boxing techniques. So let's first, let's talk about the professionals. Um, if you um, are willing to spend the money, professional packers will, can come and pack all your stuff in, of course, in boxes, and they use all sorts of packing materials and a huge amount of boxes because they make sure that it's going to get there to the other end. A, they're going to be trained. B, they're going to have a lot of packing materials, and if they pack it, then it falls under their insurance. So when you pack it and a moving company comes, they call that packed by customer and then it falls outside of their insurance coverage. So if something breaks in a box that you pack, then they're not responsible for it. So if you hire professional mover, movers to go across the country or go across town, if they're gonna pack it, then it covers in their insurance and you're okay. But there's still gonna be things that professional movers won't pack. Uh, there's things that they exclude on their list. Some of them, most all of them exclude hazardous chemicals, for instance, so all the household cleaners that you have, they consider that unsafe, chemicals, flammable, whatever, and so anything that, like that isn't gonna go in their truck. So there's always gonna be certain things that either A, you want to pack no matter what, or B, they're going to refuse to put on the truck for safety and insurance purposes, and so there's always gonna be something you're gonna have to pack yourself no, no matter what. Those chemicals, basically they're trying to prevent chemicals spilling or chemicals catching on fire in the heat or chemicals tilting over onto your furniture and ruining them. And some moving companies won't even take any kind of liquid at all because if some liquid, let's say the olive oil bottle in your kitchen box starts to ooze and it soaks the box and then the box is somewhere near your couch and you get olive oil all over your couch, then you're in trouble. So a lot of moving companies now don't even want liquids of any kind in the boxes. So it depends on your company. That's the short version of professionals. They can do it. If they pack it, they do it well. Their insurance is going to cover it if they pack it. And you'll still have things that you have to pack yourself no matter what. Um, assuming that the professionals are out of it, let's talk about technique then. So the first thing you want to think about is 
the size and type of boxes. Consistent sizing makes loading and unloading and stacking the boxes on the other end easier. That's the reason to spend money on moving boxes, even if you're getting them used from somebody else. Two or three box sizes for the majority of your items will mean that they stack better in transit, like it'll be, they'll be more stable stacked in the truck, they'll be more stable on the dolly, and they will be um, you know, in better position as they travel to the new location. And then, of course, when they're unloading it all at your new house, you don't have time to unpack it all at once, and so they're gonna be hopefully stably packed in, um, in the new location if they're all in consistent sizes. So um, about boxes, I think the most important thing is that you try to use as many small book boxes as possible. Uh, that's like the smallest carton size. The reason I say that is the heavier the contents, the hard, the heavier the contents and the bigger the box, the less of your friends <laughs> can pick the box up. And also the harder it will be for you to move it around as you unpack and reposition boxes on the other end as you're going through the unpacking process. If you have a whole bunch of really heavy boxes stacked too high or three high and they all weigh a ton, it's gonna be hard for you to move them around in the house as you're going through the unpacking process, as you're searching for a particular box and you're having to move boxes around, all that kind of stuff. So you wanna use as many of the small book size boxes as possible. Um, and actually, most of your move can fit into that. And of course, there's some exceptions, but generally, book size boxes, and pr particularly don't put books in anything but book size boxes. Um, you know, a medium size, the next step, step up is a medium box. If you fill a medium box with books, no one in your family will be able to pick the box up. It'll be super heavy. So the heavier the contents, fit it in a small box, and everything else that will fit in a small box, use it, because it means that as you're unpacking, it's quicker to empty a small box. So you get that sense of accomplishment as you open a box and empty it. The small box takes less time to empty and then you could flatten a box and you've removed another box out of the way and they're gonna be easier to maneuver around. Okay, you'll spend more money on boxes that way, but no one is gonna throw their back out while they're moving a dolly full of boxes around your house. Okay, save the bigger boxes for a lighter weight and larger items. For instance, bed linens, towels, pillows, lampshades, anything like that. There will be a few kitchen items that won't fit in a book size box. Um, sometimes large platters, for instance, uh, some of the decorative serving ware, and then the kitchen appliances, right? Like the Krupp's coffee pot probably won't fit in a book box or you know, some skillet or crock pot or big Dutch kettle object there's generally uh, you know 10 or 15 percent of the kitchen that will is too large or too wide or too tall to fit into a small box and so then you need to go to medium <clears throat> the thing you have to remember about the kitchen stuff is that if it's a big kitchen object it probably weighs a lot so you don't want to stick that into a medium box and then put a whole bunch of other heavy things in that medium box again then it's going to be too heavy for everybody to pick up so you're trying to spread the weight around, right? So if you have to put a heavy kitchen appliance in something, then fill the rest of the box up with lighter stuff so that it'll still be um, easy to carry. Breakables should be in a small box whenever possible. Lots of padding to protect them. A lot of people I find think about that and so then they pack, they wrap it up a lot and they put packing on the sides and they don't think about the bottom and the top. So if you can imagine when you're packing the box, it seems like you should have packing around it, but you don't think about, then they're gonna take that box and they're gonna put that box and four others on a dolly. And if your breakable box is on the bottom of that dolly stack, there better be padding on the top and the bottom because there's gonna be a huge amount of pressure on the box, right? So make sure when you're working on breakables, things that are collectible, things that you think are very valuable or fragile, things that are super important to you, right? Make sure that there, you put a layer of padding in the bottom of the box first, then wrap all the things individually, then put padding on the sides and padding on top before you close the box. That way when the pressure is on top of the box and the top of the lid is being pushed in at the seam a little bit, it's being pushed down and at the bottom, you're not crushing your 
valuable, expensive crystal, for instance, in the box. <clears throat> Let's see, right? Hanging clothes and go in wardrobe boxes. Um, these boxes are really costly, but it sure makes loading out the closet. You know, you unhook the hangers, put them in the wardrobe box. You get to the other end, other end and you just unhang them again. Just remember that each wardrobe box is about, the bar is 24 inches. So that's two linear feet of closet rod. So if you have a huge closet with a bunch of rods, you're going to need a lot of boxes to get it all done. Um, this is a reason to make sure that you've uh, filtered your clothing and uh, hopefully gotten rid of things that you don't need on the other end so that you don't buy an expensive wardrobe box to transport two, two feet of clothes that you're never going to wear. So filter the clothes before you move, that's what I'm saying. But the wardrobe box is the easiest way to move them. Think about who will be unpacking the boxes. This is really important because that person will have to reach into the box to get the contents out. So in a small box, it's super easy. In a large box, if you go from medium to large, then the box is that much taller. And when you get down to the bottom of a large box, I'm five foot six, and when I have to unpack a large box at somebody's house, I have to bend at the waist, and my head ends up in the bottom of the box, trying to reach the box, trying to get the stuff out of the bottom. Sometimes I have to take the box and put it on its side and let the stuff fall down and so I can tilt it and let it slide out because I can't reach into the bottom of the box. So the average person trying to unload a large box will have a hard time getting to the bottom of the box while they're standing up. So this is why you limit large boxes to lightweight things, um, large things, things that are easy to pull up out of the box. Um, Lampshades in particular end up, it seems like it's a waste of the box to take the lampshade and put it inside of a box. And professional movers do that because the lampshade is basically just a sheet of paper or fabric that if the slightest poke is gonna poke a hole in it, right? So in order to transport those things, you're gonna have one box with one lampshade. Maybe if you can nest some lampshades, you can nest lampshades inside a box and get better use of it that way. But it's the only way to make sure that a lampshade arrives um, unblemished, I guess is the way to say it. So um, you may have to have a large box for that kind of stuff and that'll be easy to take out. But I've seen people pack kitchens, for instance, in a really tall box. And then when you get to the bottom, I'm, you know, ass over a tea kettle trying to get into the box to get it out. And imagine that your grandma is trying to unload her box. She does not need to be bent over at the waist with her head in a box and be at the risk of falling over trying to get the stuff out of it. So just to consider it's safer for everybody, the less large boxes you have and the lighter weight contents of them. Okay. If you reuse boxes, make sure that you remove or cover the old address labels and content labels. Um, if, the, if you have a used box and it says master bedroom and you've packed laundry stuff in it, uh, until you accidentally open that box, you're not going to find the laundry soap for two weeks or three weeks. So you want to make sure that their labels are not uh, misinforming you on the other end. So just get out your Sharpie or whatever and scratch them through so that they know it's not really a master closet. Um, you may write your laundry room on one side and it says master closet on some other side and whoever's carrying the box may see that one instead and put the box in the wrong place to unload. So just make sure you kill the old labels first before you start labeling new ones on used boxes. Okay, let's talk about techniques for packing a box. So remember that a box is a cube and it's made out of cardboard, it's not made out of metal. So to keep the sides from collapsing under the weight, of the boxes on top of it, either on the dolly or in the truck or at your end where they're being unloaded. The boxes really have to be solidly and completely full as a cube. So the more that you compactly stuff that cube, the more that you fill it with volume, cubic volume, the, the more stable the box is. So I see people load these boxes, let's say they're packing books and they're throwing books in and they just sort of toss them in. They don't try to, stack them or rack them or line them up inside the box. They just touch a bunch of boxes in and then they declare it complete and they close the lid. But the truth is there's a lot of air and space in there. And then when they put another box of books on top of it and another one and another one, this box starts to collapse because there's lots of maneuvering room and air room in them. So all of the boxes need to be made into a cube of solid on the inside 
whether it's objects or packing material to support and cushion a breakable object, you need that volume in there to keep the thing stable. Um, for transport and for, you know, the tower boxes, it's going to, they're going to load five of them up on the dolly to get them out in a hurry. And then they're going to take those five off and the other end and they're going to roll them against the wall. <laughs> and so they're going to stay stacked as five from the minute they come out of your house until you have time to unpack them. And so all of that weight is going to be putting a huge amount of pressure on the boxes on the bottom. The better um, cube filled they are, the more likely that your stuff is going to survive. Okay, let's see. A lot of people try to build that box. I don't know why the preference is, but I'm going to, I'm going to show you this with this box. So pretend this is a moving box. It's not clearly, but pretend it is. This one you see has been closed with the flaps and taped, but some people try to do this with them. They do the interlocking and see, I probably won't be able to do it now. I'm standing here. They try to do this interlocking thing. You know what I'm talking about. Ah, there. Okay. They try to do this thinking that this is going to be stable. And they do this on the bottom of the box, right? So what's the first thing that happens when it's like this is that it's weak in the middle, right? When there's pressure from other boxes and it pushes, it's going to separate and create a big hole in the middle and stuff's going to come out. So A, even if you tape this up, this is not very stable as a uh, bottom of a box particularly. And as a top, it's not going to survive well under the pressure of boxes on top of it. So a, I know it's your instinct to be clever and do this interlocking thing and tape it down. It's not going to be stable enough, okay? So B, you do this because, like this packaging right here, you can't see it, but there's tape across. So you want tape across the seam, and you also want tape this way. And the reason you do that is because if there's just tape this way, it can still pull away. See, it doesn't pull as much as the interlocking boxes, but can still pull away. But if you have tape this way, it can't separate as much. So one, two tapes this way along the seam and one across perpendicular create some, um, when it's trying to pull apart, it's got a piece of tape that's preventing it from pulling apart. And that helps your box be more stable. So you need to do that on the bottom and then on the top when you close it. That will give the box the best capacity to stay closed and sealed and not collapsing from the top or the bottom. Okay, next page. Think of it as a big X. You're going to make one along the seam and one across the side. All right, now let's talk about labeling the boxes. So you don't want to label a box expensive jewelry or alcohol or silver or collectible plates. That's just tempting fate at this point. Things that are very valuable and easily stole, stolen and sold, you want to label them in a really general way. So maybe master bedroom dresser is a better label than expensive jewelry. <laughs> um, uh, a friend, an organizer friend of mine told me that her client labeled one of her boxes expensive jewelry and one of them less expensive jewelry. And uh, guess which two boxes didn't arrive at the new home? Those were the two. So, you know, even if you can say that the mover stole them and they have to pay for them, you're still out your boxes of expensive jewelry, right? So be careful how you label stuff. You might not want to label it, you know, antique coin collection. Just saying. Think about that as you're labeling them and label them in a more general way. Okay. You want to label on the top of the box. Every, you know, there's always content lines on the top of the box which works while you're standing there packing the box, that's enough. And when you have one box that you're opening, that's enough. But once they become a stack, which immediately they will do, and as soon as they come off the truck in your new house, there's going to be, be a stack, right? And you won't be able to see any of those labels. And the one on the top will be over your head. So you need to label the top of the box, and you also need to label at least one side. Um, the people that are unloading your boxes will not, of course, be thinking about which way that label is facing when they're making a stack of boxes in your room. But if you label one and it may be, you know, if you're super energetic, you can label two of them, then you have sort of a 50-50 chance that it'll be facing the right way. And it also means that you can spin the boxes in place until you get to a, a side label that tells you what the box is. This becomes super important when you're desperate to find the box that has the fill in the blank in it and you know what it was labeled, you just can't find the box and you don't want to move 
you know, 27 towers of four or five boxes to find the top label that gives you the right answer. So um, get, do yourself a favor on the unpacking end, <laughs> label the top, label at least one side or two sides if you can. Okay, if you're up to it. Um, make sure that you write large and easy to read from a few feet away. And I say that because I've seen people get out their pen and write like they're writing on a piece of paper and they write really, really small print. And then that box ends up three boxes back against the wall with a bunch of boxes in front of it. And you're trying to lean around the side and push them to be able to see the label. And it's so far back away from you that you can't read it. So this is all in, in, in service of you being able to find the boxes on the other end that you need. Um, if you label it with big letters, easy to read from a ways away, it'll be easier as you're shuffling and hunting in the boxes to find what you want. Um, mark any box, unpack first, if it has contents that you use every day. So typically there is stuff in every room in your house that you use every day. The coffee pot springs to mind. Um, your desk accessories, if you work from home, the stuff that you need to function at your desk every day. Um, in the bathroom, in your bedroom, for instance, it's going to be the stuff that you use to get dressed in the morning. Here's your deodorant, and here's the makeup, and here's whatever's on your list for the morning routine. So you probably want to make an unpack first box out of every room that only has the stuff that's super important for you to get to right away. And if you pack all that stuff in one box and close it and mark unpack first bedroom, unpack first bathroom, unpack first kitchen, excuse me, you will end up getting yourself in motion again at the new location a lot faster. You can unpack the rest of the stuff around you if you have all the things you need to get dressed in the morning, go back to work, um, be able to work at your desk and pay the bills, whatever, be able to make food and eat. And so, you want to grab a box that's got super important stuff in every room or, you know, and if it's a room that doesn't have anything that's super important every day, then don't worry about it. But make sure that you can put your hands on the contents that you want to access immediately on the other end and mark those unpack first. Okay. Let's talk about furniture that will move with the contents in place. Either you or the movers will decide that keeping all the clothes in the chest of drawers, will work if they just stretch wrap, you know, the big roll of stretch wrap that's got handles on it, movers use, and they'll go and stretch wrap all the way around the chest of drawers and that'll keep the doors closed and they'll say, yeah, we'll just move it with the contents in place. And of course they sell that stretch wrap at Home Depot and Lowe's and box company stores. And so you too can stretch wrap your furniture and move things in place. So the only thing that you have to worry about is after you stretch wrap the dresser, in order to move it out of your bedroom and along the hallway and down the stairs or down the driveway and into the truck and out the truck and up the stairs and on the other end, somebody's gonna put that chest of, chest of drawers on a dolly and they're gonna stand it up at a 45 degree angle. So all the contents in the drawers are gonna shift and they may put it into the truck and it, it ends up on its back or it ends up on end in the, in the truck. So. All of the contents of those things are gonna shift around. Now clearly your PJs are not gonna fall out the little slot in the back, but anything that you have that's small in any of those drawers is gonna get tossed around and it's gonna slide up over the lip and out the back. And they're gonna be dropping little trails of gradu out the back of the chest of drawers as they wheel it out of your house. So <clears throat> any furniture that you wanna move in place, you wanna inspect the drawers for small things and then go in and Ziploc it. Get out of Ziploc dump all the little bitty things in it, Ziploc it, you can put it right back in the drawer. The Ziploc will float around, but the Ziploc probably won't come out the back the same way that a paper clip or a pin or a piece of jewelry, for instance, would come out the back of the drawer and fall down. So if you Ziploc all that stuff in place, then as they move the dresser around, all will be well. Um, <clears throat> the other equivalent is um, a filing cabinet. Think about a filing cabinet. The filing cabinet is a great thing to put in, leave all the paper in the drawers and they just slap the file cabinet on the dolly. But again, it's gonna be at a you know, 45 degree angle while they roll it and bounce it down the stairs, right? Ed, remember the file cabinet and they were like strapped, they had it strapped and they were carrying it down your, your stairwell and it was like at a horrible angle. Oh, so, yeah. right? 
those um, Pendaflex folders and the contents inside are not designed to hang. They're just going to flop around right inside the drawer. And there's a lot of airspace in those drawers. So the best way to secure a file cabinet is to pull the drawer open and to take um, packing material like newsprint or bubble pack, pack the sides all down the sides of the file drawer so the papers can't slide out the sides and then pack the top of the file drawer just like it's a box, right? So put a bunch of cushioning in there and make sure that it's completely full and close it. And then they can shrink wrap the drawers closed so they won't pop out. And then when they tilt it like this, the stuff is just going to be cushioned by all the paper that's surrounding it and it, it'll shift, but it likely won't come off the rods. It won't, the stuff won't come flying. It won't fall out the back of the drawer and onto the floor. You won't lose anything that way. So it's a great way to ensure that your files don't get completely scrambleized. The thing about those things is they're so heavy and whoever has to move them is going to be struggling, jostling. <laughs> you know, they're going to be bouncing. They may drop it. And so those contents are going to get, you know, tossed like cookies. Better that you um, impact them, you know, pack them all up with cushioning so that they can't go anywhere no matter what anybody does to the file cabinet. <laughs> and then even if they drop it or it falls on its side, they're just going to fall into the cushioning. They're not going to fall off and out and come apart. So um, file cabinets are super important. Um, also think about desks. Um, people think, oh, let's move the desk. And it has, you know, a little pullout drawer that has all your little pins and stuff in it. Or it has a couple of little drawers that have little drawer dividers with little, po little uh, pockets, little holes and little cubbies in them with stuff in them. Those work really great keeping everything separate because your desk is never moving, right? Your desk is stationary. So once they shrink wrap those door closed, they're again, they're going to put it on end. They're going to put it on its back. They're going to lift it up and roll it out at a 45 degree angle. So that stuff is going to completely scrambleize. So any kind of a drawer that has little bits off of supplies, just Ziploc all of that. You can keep it in the drawer, just take it all and put it in a whole bunch of Ziplocs and throw it back in. Then the Ziplocs will toss around like crazy, but you will still be able to just take them, open the Ziplocs, and pour it all back in place when you're done. Moral of the story is, don't forget that furniture does not move in the exact position that it lives in your house. They're going to take it and move it around and stand it around and do all sorts of things with it. And so whatever those contents are, they need to be buffered against all that movement so that you don't lose it all out of the crack of the back of the drawer on the way, on the trip bookshelves are a good one that get shrink wrapped and moved they will take the books off but they'll shrink wrap it and then roll the bookcase out and the problem is that those shelves are just resting on pins they're not you know they might have one stationary shelf but the other shelves are just wood sitting on pins right and so as soon as they tilt it those things start coming apart <clears throat> the first thing that you lose is the pins, right? Those little bitty things go flying and you're, and they're gone. So you want to a empty the bookcase and pack the books in a box. B then you want to take the shelves off and take the pins out and Ziploc the pins all in a Ziploc bag, take that and the shelves and put it all together and then stretch wrap the whole thing. So now you have the shelves and the pins that go with the shelves all packaged together. They can move the frame of the bookshelf. And they can move the pack of uh, shelves as a separate unit and everything will be together. You won't lose anything. And at the other end, you just cut through the stretch wrap and you put the pins back and you put the shelves and you're ready to unload. So that's the safest way to get a bookshelf there. Okay. A bookshelf. Ah, couches and chairs. <clears throat> so big furnitures that have cushions, uh, they will now stretch wrap the professional stretch wrap that stuff. They put the, um, stretch wrap around the cushions and the pillows so that it all stays in place so they're not dropping any cushions on the way. And the good thing about the stretch wrap is I've seen uh, movers unload the couch and they might be having to unload like I did a job and moved to Austin and the, 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 they had to unload in the rain on the other end. So here comes the couch out and instead of getting completely soaked, it's covered in stretch wrap so it got a little damp but mostly the stretch wrap kept it dry. So it's a good way to keep your dirty hands from making a mess on the couch. You are scuffing walls and things as you, you know, going through doorways and it'll help protect the fabric and it'll be uh, something in 
the first line of defense against rips and tears as it goes through the building, the truck, off the truck, on and off the dolly. Th that stretch wrap will help protect and hopefully get your large, soft, cushy furniture there without ruining it. Okay, what about specialty items? There are lots of long, pokey items, long, skinny, pokey stick things that are in your house. Uh, top of the list is uh, brooms and mops and Swiffer extension rods and things like that. If you have a whole bunch of things like that in your house, most of us usually have some kind of collection. Um, trying to manage them, A, they won't fit in a box, right? That's like a completely non-starter for a box. And generally people just sort of pick them up and kind of lug them as a unit and they drop one as they go and they start tripping and they fall in and it makes a big mess. So this is the perfect thing to stretch wrap. So get a bunch of those tall poking things, put them together and stretch wrap it all together. Then they can carry it as a unit. One piece isn't constantly falling out and you will be able to, either you or the movers will be able to transport it much easier. And then of course you, hack through it on the other end and poof you've got all your rods back. The other one that comes to mind is uh, things like sports equipment like golf clubs, ski poles, skis. These are all long skinny pokey things and the golf clubs are all great until you try to move them. <laughs> golf clubs are dying to stand in the corner and you pull one club out at a time and then you tilt them and wheel them off down the road but moving golf clubs that are open like that on the top of course they're, you know, they're not super stable. And the first time that you touch them wrong, the whole thing falls over and then the clubs all start falling out. So this is a perfect thing to stretch wrap. Take the clubs, sh stretch wrap all around, stretch it to the club bag as well. And then if it falls over, you're not losing the clubs. It can just fall over and be righted again. It can stand inside the truck. If it falls over in the truck, you're not gonna, the clubs aren't gonna come out. It's a good way to contain the stuff for movement. And of course you unwrap it on the other end. Um, same with skis, ski poles, all that kind of stuff. They're long and pokey and difficult. They won't fit in a box. Shrink wrap all that stuff together and then it'll be easy as a unit to move it. Okay. Another specialty items is, is uh, dishes. And you wouldn't typically think of that except that we generally, think that how they sit in the cabinet is how they should be packed in the box. So they're in a stack, one on top of the other in a cabinet, and people tend to lift them down, wrap them, and sit them straight into the box like that. The problem with that in, in terms of moving and in transit is that all of that weight in the cabinet, the weight is not bouncing. It never bounces in the cabinet. <laughs> but in a box, in a truck, it's always bouncing, right? And so depending on how delicate and your dishware is, the dishes on the top are gonna to crush, break, crack the ones on the bottom. It's too much weight for in transit, even if it is wrapped and cushioned in between. So professionals pack the dishes standing on end. So A, you have to have cushioning in the bottom of the box, just like any other breakable. B, you wanna wrap each dish separately, and then you wanna stand them on end. You wanna make sure that they're not gonna fall over in the box, so the box needs to be completely full and then you need cushing around and the top. That way, as the box bounces, the dishes are not bouncing on top of each other, they're just bouncing on the edge. And if there's sufficient cushioning underneath, then the only thing you have to worry about is the box is stacked on top of them. If you've packed it well, then it can absorb that much cushioning, and it'll be okay. So go against your initial <laughs> instinct, which is to just stack them like they are in the cabinet, stand them on in and that way they'll survive better. Okay, let's talk about the opened packages or bottles of product in your house. In your bathroom, for instance, there is all of the lotions and potions that sit on the top of the counter that you use every day, or the lotions and potions that are in the shower that are open and in use. Most people tend to pack those things, they don't think too hard about them, they pack them, they throw them in a box and they assume it's gonna survive. The truth is those packages are not super designed for you know, safe in transit once they're open. So I would A, take every, all of them down and make sure that you've screwed them really tight. I might tape the top down, like put a piece of tape around the lid so that it, you know, whatever comes out is gonna hit tape first and resist leakage. 
then I would wrap that up in newsprint and stand it in a box upright. So hopefully, hopefully your box is gonna stay upright most of the time, even if it tilts to the side some on the dolly, going up and down stairs or whatever, um, it will be mostly upright. And if you stand all those things upright in a box and then cushion it so they can't flop over, that's important, they can't flop over. That way they're not then gonna ooze in your box and then ooze onto whatever the box is sitting on. And you know, depending on how liquid it is, it might ooze onto the furniture that it's next to in the truck. So this is why uh, movers are getting away from don't put liquids in the containers because if it tilts and oozes inside the container, whatever that container is near is also going to get oozed on. And you don't want your couch ruined by your, you know, shampoo bottle oozing out the side of the bottle. So tape the bottle closed, store it standing up, put a bunch of wrap each piece individually and put it inside a container that is surrounded by packaging. Um, and make sure that it's very, you know, tightly packed so that there's not, there's not a lot of flop room, right? Um, the same goes for, think about all of the oils and vinegars and jars of things that have liquid in them in your kitchen. So all of the cans and bottles that are not open yet can generally be wrapped, in, uh, uh, wrapped and stacked in a box and they'll be fine. But the ones that are open, you know what an olive oil bottle looks like that's half used right there's dribbles down the side and it no matter how tight you close it still leaks and so there's there's definitely a risk there of that stuff getting on your on some other contents in your truck so again take those things tape them up roll them up individually stand them up and then I would mark the outside of the box you know kitchen pantry open jars or whatever so that you know that's the one that needs to stay upright and you know hopefully the movers will do that and hopefully they'll survive but if there's enough paper in there and it's taped and and each individually wrapped it may ooze inside its paper but it probably won't lo uh, lose enough that it's then going to come out of the box onto something else so let's talk a little bit this is the last thing for me and then you guys can ask questions what about some moving resources? So <clears throat> if you're buying uh, fresh brand new boxes in large quantities, you want to head for a box store or um, something like half price boxes or anchor box. Similar stores exist. Anchor box is in Houston, but I'm sure there's other boxes like that around the country, around the world. Um, there are people that sell boxes and that's all they sell. So when you do that, you can go buy in large quantities packs of 25 you'll get better discounts for that for that volume they always have packing materials like boxes or packs of newsprint bubble pack in big rolls um, specialty boxes like long skinny boxes for artwork or something like that um, flat screen tv boxes they're um all, they're a good resource to get a whole bunch of boxes at the best price and specialty boxes and all the rest of the packing materials you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's now. They all have moving sections that have these materials, but that's probably not going to be the best pricing for that kind of stuff. The a box specialty store will give you a better price than that. But <clears throat> I've certainly run into Home Depot and grabbed packing supplies when I was trying to pack up a room or a storage unit or something. I wasn't going to pack the whole house. Certainly easy and convenient. Okay, so... Um, if you want to get used boxes, you can pay a slightly lesser price. There's a, there's a website called usedcardboardboxes.com. Uh, you go online to usedcardboardboxes.com and you can uh, buy used boxes and they ship them to you. And they're really good quality. Of course, they filter them for the quality. And so boxes that got used once and they're perfectly fine. You can buy them at a lesser price. They have all the sizes that they would have at a regular box store. And it's a way for you to get cheaper boxes. Um, a lot of people go on to Facebook or next door neighborhood and they will uh, pull out a call. Hey, I need moving boxes. Who has some? And trust me, all of your friends that have a house or an apartment have moved and they all have a mad amount of boxes that they've stored in the corner, in the garage, in the attic that they would be thrilled to death to hand off to you and get out of their hair. So um, if you really just want boxes and have as little cost as possible, 
put out a call to all your friends and all your friends' friends and your neighborhood. <laughs> all, use your social media and say, I need boxes, and people will chime in. Um, they might have excess tape and that kind of stuff, but um, if you can't come up with that on your own, please, the box store is going to have stretch wrap. They're going to have tape. They're going to have all that kind of stuff. So you can get all that from the box store. Okay. That's my resource conversation. <sighs> okay. That was a whole lot about packing. And so now the question is, who has a question about something specific? How do you ship yard tools? There's a good one. So yard tools are... Um, Another thing that they're long and pokey and kind of dangerous, people could get hurt on them. So again, that whole, you know, long and skinny ones, you can shrink wrap them together. And you can also take uh, the newsprint, the newspaper, and on the blade end where all of the, you know, here's the, the shovel, the pointy end of the shovel, here's the tines of the brakes and things. You can put newsprint over all that stuff before you stretch wrap them all together. And that would make it easy to go. If you're actually trying to ship them in the mail, like not moving them, but ship them as a package through the mail, um, then I would go to a box store and you can go to the UPS store, FedEx store and let them box it for you. And they will either have a box or cut down a box for you. But um, if you want to ship it yourself or prepare it yourself, you can go to a box store. They're going to have lots of specialty boxes. So they do have long skinny ones that, you know, are maybe a foot by foot and then really long and skinny and you can stand all those up in there. Same thing about cushioning, um, make sure that they can't poke their way out of the cardboard because it's cardboard, right? And so rakes and shovels are going to poke right through that stuff unless you, you know, put a little guard in between. So um, <clears throat> I, if you have a whole lot of them and you're trying to put them in the mail, I would go and get a specific box that will carry them all. I would still stretch wrap them together. I would still put newsprint around the ends a lot of cushioning in the package to protect, protect, prevent them from poking out. Um, if you don't want to worry about it, go straight to the UPS store and say, pack these for me. <laughs> okay. So I used to buy labels two by three in all kinds of colors and slap on sides of boxes, one color per room for easy distribution in the new place, right? Blue bedroom, green kitchen, red garage. That is a great idea. And particularly it's a quick visual reference. So she's talking about, I'm sorry. That she's just making a comment about using color-coded labels to help people know what's going to go where. So you can pick some uh, large, what in essence are mailing labels that come in color, and put that color on all the master boxes, get a blue label, all the, the you know, kitchen boxes get a yellow label, et cetera, et cetera. And you can write master or kitchen on top of them, but it's the color that's the trigger. So if you put color labels on the boxes and you put a color at the door on the other end, then they can match color to color and it makes distribution of those boxes super quick and easy. I forgot to talk about artwork and television. So um, professional movers generally take large artwork off the wall and they wrap it in those big blue moving blankets that are dense, you know, and then they strap them to the side of the truck with bungee cords and whatever their strapping is. And then they travel pretty safely. And they do that with the flat screen televisions as, as well. But if you're not a professional mover, you're not going to have that kind of A side of a truck and B strapping in order to accomplish that. So if you are trying to move artwork yourself, then this is another reason to go to a box store because they will have long, skinny, you know, that might be two or three inches wide and then long and skinny. and two sides that insert one inserts into the other so you can put one on one end of the piece of artwork and then slide the box over until it covers it and tape it closed um, same with the flat screen they're going to have those skinny boxes that you can put a flat screen tv in um, if you saved your flat screen box with all its you know styrofoam awesome but you know the likelihood is you probably let that go and you can get a box to move it in in the appropriate time um, you want all that to be cushioned of course, and smaller artwork, little pieces, you can probably wrap and put inside of a box with, uh, and everything will be safe. I would just wrap them all in newsprint very carefully so that, like, if you have artwork that doesn't have a glass covering, it's, you don't want one, the back of one artwork to be scratching the front of another piece of art, so they need to be individually wrapped. <clears throat> 
If you have a bunch of artwork that has glass on the front, you probably want to turn two pieces together with the glasses facing each other and then uh, newsprint, bubble wrap, all that stuff together as a, as a unit and tape it down so it can go into a box with the glass facing each other and then the frames are protecting that glass, hopefully. Um, so I would take all of the artwork that's small enough and wrap it and put it in a box, but anything that's big on the wall, um, if you're going to do it yourself, go get a specialty box to put it in. Um, it's going to cost you a little bit of money, but depending on how valuable your artwork is, you, uh, you know, you know whether you cost you a lot of money and whether you're worried about it surviving. And so the bigger the piece of glass, the easier that, you know, if something catches it in the middle, it's going to crack. It's going to break that glass. The glass is not designed for things to be bammed into it, right? So that's why they strap them up in, in big blankets and strap them to the wall when they're putting them in the trucks. Um, if you have to do it, wrap it, wrap it, wrap it, wrap it, and stick it in a specialty box and just move those boxes instead. That's the, that's the way that the um, DIY mover can get it uh, safely there like a mover does in a truck. Michelle okay. had a question. Any more tips on packing dishes, bowls, cups? Um, those, so A, you should wrap them individually. Uh, the bowls you can nest and stand on end just like the plates if you want. Um, some sh like soup bowls, for instance, are pretty shallow. They're, they're basically a plate with the edge curled up, <laughs> you know, so any kind of a large bowl like that, that's shallow, I would wrap and stack just like the dishes. And then you can just nest them one inside the other in the box. Um, otherwise, remember that plates are heavy use the smallest box that they'll fit in and you know make sure there's cushioning on all sides to protect them um, my only worry is that when you start getting into the china area when you're working with fine china or porcelain that's really thin easily broken you know those things need to be individually wrapped they need to be have a whole lot of protection if you can get those in, in inserting little uh, cardboard liners that separate things um, I would do that with your specialty china or um, fancy stuff. You know, if it's uh, from Ikea and it's pretty solid and you can just wrap it and put it in a box loose, that would be great. But if it's something that's, you know, your grandmother's china or something you bought at, uh, you know, really nice stuff from your wedding, for instance, that kind of stuff, um, the finer it is, the more packing it needs and the more insulation it needs against, um, you know, jostling and breakage. So. Well, and you can especially dish packs that have all the layers, you know, cardboard layers in between and inserted interlocking racks, I guess, I guess is what the best way I can say it in between. Yes, sir. I was going to say you can also sort of model your packing on uh, the way Replacements Limited does it. If you've ever ordered anything from Replacements, they put a, a generous layer of packing peanuts in the bottom of the box maybe like eight or 10 inches before they even add any dishes. And then they'll have every little group of dishes. There will be packing be, you know, in between, you know, they wrap one, they nest another one, they wrap that, they nest another one, they wrap that. And then those are layered on the peanuts and more peanuts go in. And so you get, you know, you might get like eight, eight items in a box that's about a two foot cube you know right and that's but there's big. enough there's enough cushioning to keep it from breaking yeah nothing moves because there are peanuts everywhere yeah and and that's a good point too that you know you can wrap individually four soup bowls for instance and then you can wrap those four as a pack again wrap it all as a unit and tape it down and stand it on in in the box um you know more cushioning is better newsprint is cheap so um, I would err on the side of caution, and if you're worried about it at all, uh, use more boxes, use more packing material, and that's the end of it. And that's why when people get to the other end, they're like, oh my God, there's so many boxes here. How did this happen? When the movers pack it, because they're using that err on the side of caution technique, and they use a lot of cushioning, and they use a lot of newsprint, and they spread things out on boxes so that your stuff arrives safely and they don't have to pay for it, which is the ultimate goal. <laughs> okay. Tim, what else? Tim made a great comment. Uh, he said, one thing to watch out for if you use professional movers to pack things is what they add to the inventory item entries. He said, I use pro move movers often when in the military. Uh, 
and they were the Packers were trained to put C, S, B, or D and, and other codes, uh, letter codes on items, meaning chip, broken, scratch, dirty, and so on, and that they would put letters on everything, even the new stuff, as a way to limit insurance liability. Speak to, you know, things you can do to, to kind of protect yourself working professional movers. So if you have professional packers coming to pack, um, the people that get char that they're being, if they're charging you for professional packers, generally most of them will have training. Some of them will be new. And so I would um, do your best to be around while they're packing. Don't like disappear, stand there with them and chat with them while they work or, you know, be in the room so you can generally watch. Um, when I work with square cow movers, for instance, they will come and show me as they pick it up and they notice that something's broken, they will come and show it to me and say, I, this is broken. So they're trained to spot and then show the mover or show the client that it is broken. Um, I can't speak to all other moving companies, but generally a professional team is going to, if they see that there's something wrong, they're going to come and show it to you in advance so that um, they don't get in trouble for it, basically, on the front end. Um, I remember eons ago, before I ever got in this business, my my dad's mother, my grandmother from way back, she collected um, little teacups from all over her travels. Like, that was her travel collectible, was these little teacups that she had on racks on the wall. And she was just like, I don't trust the movers. If it breaks, I wanted to know it's my fault. And so that particular, she would let them pack everything else, but if it was super important to her, like those cups, she would pack them herself and take that box with her so that she couldn't blame the movers <laughs> for the problem. <laughs> so it made her feel more comfortable. And I find that if it's super important to you, like when we moved into our house a few years ago, um, I did not want a bunch of 25 year old guys moving my glass beads that you know it was like don't get into my hobby stuff and start slinging those beads around no so <laughs> I packed all of my beads up myself and I actually moved them myself I kept them out of the move completely because I want to control over the beads 100% and I wanted to know that they were being well packed and that you know they don't know what they're looking at if you suspect that the movers don't have the expertise to know what they're looking at then you know they're going to use their general packing techniques but if you think it needs more than that you might want to pack it yourself and carry it yourself clearly you can't do that with a whole house but you know things that you think are super super important to you you might as well you know take control of them i always have so any job hat with professionals has guys at various level guys and ladies of various level of training they may be new they may you know that sometimes they train them in advance but they don't learn everything all at once right they learn from experience and so um the job for instance to austin they decided that they needed to um take this antique dresser chest of drawers that had all these drawers in it and they were going to stretch wrap it and take it that way except that somebody who wasn't didn't realize that they were dealing with an antique, thought that it would be better to tape the drawers closed first. And so he got packing tape and he taped all the way around every drawer on this antique dresser. So he put packing tape on an antique finish wood piece and then they stretch wrapped on top of it. And so if I had noticed that and been there, I would have been like, no, no, no. We don't put tape on the antique finish of the hundred year old piece, no. And my dad, who was in the moving business for a long time, said the way that you accomplish that is if you think it needs to be taped closed, then you turn the tape around with the sticky side out and you go around something so that the tape, you tape onto the tape itself, but the sticky side is out, it's not on the finish. That way you're not getting stickiness on a hundred year old wood finish that might peel off if you, jerk the tape too hard right so uh, yes professional packers and movers are trained and they're probably more skilled at it than you but you don't have 100 percent control over how trained each person is on the team and so a you need to observe them and you know stop them if you're worried 
and pack the stuff yourself that you really want control over that you don't want to worry about at all. Like if you drop it, it's your own fault. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be super careful. You're going to have the reverence and, and be careful with it in a way that a mover who's trying to, you know, they're getting paid by the hour. You don't want the job to be expensive. You want them to be hurrying, hurrying, hurrying. And so they're going to be booking it, trying to pack your stuff and move it. And, you know, they're doing that because you want the bill to be low. So they, they're doing what you want them to do. But in, in that rush and busyness, you know, mistakes get made. So if you're super worried about it, pack it yourself. Is that enough about movers? <laughs> <laughs> um, Michelle added, buy the insurance, not just the two, not just the two cents per pound, et cetera. Yes, buy the extra insurance, especially if you, yeah, I mean, if you're worried about the stuff, the more insurance you buy, the easier it's going to be for you to collect. She's right about that. So um, depending, and particularly if you're going, you know, from Texas across the country, and you're going to be loaded on with four other families on a huge semi, and they're going to be stopping and unloading half the truck. Uh, you know, they're going to make three stops before they get to your destination. You know, the more insurance, the better. If you're moving in town and they're loading you and unloading you in the same day and nobody, nobody else is on your truck, it's, you don't have as much of a risk, but the, the longer and farther, the more insurance, the better. And, you know, the more valuable your stuff is, the more insurance, the better, right? It's right. just like, you know, whether you have good in health insurance or not when you get sick. Okay, what else? We are about out of time, so let's wrap it up. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thanks, we, you guys. We want to let everyone know that the next <laughs> online Cutter Conversation event will be on Tuesday, September 25th at 1201 Central Time. And our next yes. in-person event will be on Thursday, October 25th at 7 p.m. at a Healing Collective in Houston. We'll announce topics for those events soon. If you'd like to receive notifications about upcoming events, you can join the meetup group at meetup.com slash Houston hyphen clutter hyphen coaching. You can also follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our mailing list. We love to hear from you. So please send us your questions and topic suggestions in the YouTube comments. And you can also reach us through our website at clutterfairyhouston.com. Thanks everybody. Bye.